This is a lecture for how to use GANs for compressed sensing with a particular emphasis on theory. So let's remind ourselves what is compressed sensing. Right, so this is a problem where we might have an image, which we call x star, which we'll let be in Rn. And then we're going to have an observation matrix, which is going to take this n-dimensional image and gives us m measurements. So we have an A, which is a m by n matrix, and here, generally speaking, m is going to be less than n. So then we're going to have eta, which is an rm. This is a noise uh, vector or a vector of errors. And so then we have uh, measurements given by y equals ax star plus eta. So the compressed sensing problem is given y and given a, find x star. Now, as m is less than n, we have an underdetermined problem. And so that means by basic linear algebra, there's an infinity of solutions of images that are exactly consistent with the measurements y. So in order to identify what the correct or best image is, we have to assume some sort of structure. Right? In particular, we need to have a notion of what it means to be, quote, natural, so that we can choose among the consistent images and return the one that is the most natural. Now, we've seen earlier in the class that you know, one view of naturalness is that an image should be sparse or approximately sparse in a wavelet basis. And then we believe that things that are more sparse in a wavelet basis would be more natural than things that are less sparse. But here we're going to take a different perspective. We're going to take a perspective from generative modeling. So let's uh, remind ourselves what that means. Here, as a generative model, suppose we have trained or learned a function g, which is a map from rk to rn, and it maps a variable z, which we'll call the latent code, into an image x that corresponds to z. So here the idea is that this is a generative model, which means it samples from a particular learned distribution. Here that would mean that g of z is a sample for z following a standard normal in rk, uh, and then this approximately samples some particular natural signal distribution. And we have seen various ways of doing this, for example, variational autoencoders or generative adversarial networks, and those have both handed us Gs that, uh, uh, can, that are generative models uh, with low uh, latent dimensional representations. Now, once we have a generative model, then the idea for compressed sensing is to use it as being a proxy for what makes images natural. So in particular, we'll say an image is natural if it's in the range of G, and things that are not in the range of G are not natural. So then now back to our compressed sensing problem where we're trying to find an image given measurements of it, we then are searching for what consistent image, what image consistent with the measurements uh, is in the range of G. Now let's see this uh, from a visual perspective. All right, so what's shown here is, uh, so you should think of ambient space as being the set of all possible images. And then you can see this manifold, which is the range of G. This is going to be some subset of that space. And th this is going to be learned in order to represent the natural signal class. So here, uh, natural images, we should think as all of the points that are on this manifold. And this is a k-dimensional manifold because our functions g was a map from rk into rn, so its output really has k degrees of freedom. Now there's some point x star, which was the point that was imaged. And then some measurements a of x star that was taken. Now, as we discussed before, since m is less than n, there's a null space to the measurement operator. And this is shown by this line in blue. And so all points along this blue line are consistent with the measurements. However, only one of them as drawn like intersects the uh, manifold. All right, so our goal is to hopefully have a situation which looks like this, where there's uh, an intersection of the set of consistent points with the natural signal manifold at exactly one point. Uh, so how do we actually recover this, uh, you know, this image in practice? Well, we would solve the following optimization problem, right? We might say 
I want to minimize over all images in the range of the generative model uh, which one is most consistent with my measurements. So I could minimize over z in RK the L2 norm of AG of z minus y. And I could minimize this in particular by um, a gradient method or, or however you like. And this formulation was introduced by this, uh, this Bora paper from the group at University of Texas at Austin. Right. Once you have the z that corresponds to minimizing uh, this objective, then you would get the x by simply applying g to that z. Once we have this formulation written down, uh, we are led to several questions. Right? How many measurements are needed in order to recover a signal of interest? Right? Hopefully this number isn't too high. But also, uh, is this formulation really the right problem to be solving? Which is to say, if you solve this minimization, do you get the answer that you're looking for? And baked into that, we have like questions that we've seen multiple times before, which is, are you stable to noise? What if you're uh, imaging a point that's not exactly on the range of G? Well, are you stable to being off of that range? Uh, and other aspects like this. So then the, the final question, which we'll address is, can this problem even be solved? After all, this is a non-convex optimization problem because G of Z is typically a neural network and that is non-convex. Uh, and so it's not obvious that running a gradient method would even find the optimizer to this problem. And so we'll discuss some guarantees uh, that can be made in certain cases in that setting. All right, so now let's start with theory for compressed sensing with GAN priors. And this work is going to follow very closely the, what's in the, the Bora paper. And so let's give ourselves the, the setup. The setup is that we have a G from RK to RN, and it's a D-layer ReLU neural network with at most N nodes per layer. And then we're going to assume, just for simplicity, that our measurement operator is uh, random. In particular, it has IID N0, 1 over M entries. So now we can state a theorem for recovery. Right? So this theorem says, fix an image, any image, in Rn. And then suppose you have measurements given by Ax star plus eta. Now suppose you have enough measurements here, m needs to be big omega of kd log n. And then suppose further that you have approximately solved the optimization problem. So that is to say, suppose you have this z hat latent code such that a g of z hat minus y in L2 norm is within epsilon of the minimum value it can be. So as written down here, the L2 norm of AG of Z hat minus Y is less than epsilon plus the minimum value of the L2 norm of AG of Z minus Y. So if this is the case, then with probability one minus E to the negative big omega of M, then the image that you get, G of Z hat, is near X star up to a couple of sources of error. And so the first source of error is this term that scales like the the minimum distance from x star to the range of g. Uh, the second term is the L2 norm of eta, which is the noise level. And then the third term it goes like epsilon, which is the error from uh, that we were able to assume that we were solving the optimization up to error epsilon. Right? So again, here there's three sources of error. This first source of error is the image that you're imaging might not actually be in the range of the GAN. And so given that the output of this process is always something in the range of GAN, we're definitely limited by how closely the GAN actually approximates this image X star. And so this we call the representation error. And then the second term is the noise level. Uh, and then the third term is how much error is uh, how much error uh, is allowed in the, like, the imperfect solution to the optimization problem.
All right, so this is the theorem that we're working up to, but we have to do a, a, a bit of work to actually get to the, the point where we can prove this theorem. Right? So like, like most uh, theoretical work in compressed sensing, there's usually some like isometry or deterministic condition that's assumed to be hold. Then if that condition holds, then we prove a recovery guarantee. And then we show that a random operator A uh, meets this condition with a uh, high probability. Right? And so we're going to follow this framework as well, as was done in the, the Bora paper. But let's, let, let's see like, geometrically what we need to have happen. Right? So again, here again is the picture of the manifold um, uh, given by the range of G. And then let's say the point X star, which is uh, depicted, was imaged. And then again, this blue line is the set of images that are exactly consistent with the measurements uh, on X star. So in order to have a hope of finding X star, it's important that the null space of A doesn't bring us toward some other point on the manifold. Right? For example, if this null space of A actually included the point X, then we wouldn't be able to distinguish between X and X star. So we can say this as to guarantee injectivity of the measurements, we want the null space of A to be away from directions between pairs of points in the range of G. Now we can codify this into a, 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 a formal definition um, by using something called the, the set restricted eigenvalue condition. And so here let's define uh, the, the set restricted eigenvalue condition for a matrix A in M by N. This is going to be a condition which takes a set S and a parameter gamma, which is non-negative. And this condition is going to hold if for all points in this set, the L2 norm of A acting on X1 minus X2 is bigger than gamma times the L2 norm of X1 minus X2, where X1 and X2 are the points in the set. So you can think of this as a stable version of the claim that the null space of A is away from the secant lines within the set S. So for us, we will later on take S to be the range of the generative model um, when, in our analysis to come. Okay. All right, so now that we have this definition, we can actually state a recovery lemma, which says that if we have the set restricted eigenvalue condition, uh, then our approximate optimizer is close to the true optimizer up to representation error and the noise level. So let's uh, uh, read out this lemma. Right, so suppose we have some, some true image x star and we have some measurements y equals ax star plus eta where eta is noise. And then we're supposing further that our measurement operator A satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition uh, on some set S with parameter gamma, and that that holds with probability one minus P. So then we're further going to assume that for fixed, for any fixed image X and Rn, the L2 norm of AX is smaller than two times the L2 norm of X with probability one minus P. Uh, further, we're gonna assume that we can optimize the, um, the objective uh, ax minus y uh, up to epsilon over the set s. And so here, and we're going to assume that we found this point x hat, which is within epsilon of the optimizer over all of x, over all of s, and x hat is within s. So if all of this holds, then with probability 1 minus 2p, then the, we, we have the, the, the candidate minimizer is close to the true solution uh, up to representation error and noise level and the optimization error that we allowed. And in particular, uh, it's within four over gamma plus one times the minimum distance between uh, X star and S, you know, plus two times the L2 norm of eta plus epsilon all divided by gamma. And so we can prove this lemma.
All right, so to prove this lemma, let, let's remind ourselves of the notation. So remember, x star was the, the true image, and it's not necessarily in the set S. So x bar is the closest point in the set S to x star in an L2 sense. So this is the closest image within S. Then x hat is going to be our candidate minimizer, or our approximate minimizer, and it's going to satisfy a x hat minus y in L2 norm is within epsilon of the minimum value of all uh, a x minus y in L2 norms over all x in S. All right, so now let's write down what it is we're interested in. We're interested in bounding the L2 norm of x hat minus x star. And so it's natural first to break it up into how far is it from the closest point in the range of, uh, or in S, and then um, how close are we to that closest point in S. All right, so first by the triangle inequality, we'll write x hat minus x star as being x star minus x bar plus x bar minus x hat, and then apply the triangle inequality for the norms. Now the rest of the derivation is all going to focus on this second term. So the second term, x bar minus x hat, this we can uh, upper bound by the L2 norm of A acting on x bar minus x hat all over gamma. And this is by the set restricted eigenvalue condition, directly using it. Uh, once we have this, then we can use the triangle inequality to add and subtract y within this, uh, inner, uh, within this norm. And so we end up getting the L2 norm of ax bar minus y plus the L2 norm of ax hat minus y all over again. Uh, now here's where we use the uh, fact that x hat is an approximate minimizer. So because x hat is an approximate minimizer, then this value norm of ax hat minus y will be no bigger than uh, norm of ax bar minus y plus epsilon. So here in the next line, we see this term goes to 2 L2 norm of ax bar minus y plus epsilon all over again. And that, again, followed by the, the definition uh, of x hat being approximate minimizer. All right, so now we're going to expand what's in the, the norm by adding and subtracting ax star and using the uh, triangle inequality. Um, so we'll get the, the 2 times the norm of ax bar minus ax star plus 2 times the norm of ax star minus y plus epsilon all over gamma. Now, this second term, the ax star minus y, that was the definition of eta. So we can replace that with the L2 norm of eta. Uh, and then the first term uh, stays unchanged. And now we can appeal to the assumption that we assumed that ax was less than uh, 2 times the norm of x uh, for any particular x with a certain probability. So here we're just using the upper bound uh, on a uh, in order to get this term for L2 norm of x bar minus x star uh, plus 2 L2 norm of eta plus epsilon all over again. So this followed by the upper bound assumption on A, which held for any particular fixed point, uh, in this case x bar minus x star, with probability 1 minus p. Uh, all right, so then collecting all the terms, we have that the L2 norm of x hat minus x star is less than or equal to 1 plus 4 over gamma, the L2 norm of x star minus x bar plus 2 times the L2 norm of eta plus epsilon all over again. So this concludes the proof that if you have the set restricted eigenvalue condition, then the recovered point of an approximate optimizer is uh, close to what it should be up to the representation error, the noise level, and the degree to which the optimization problem was approximately solved. So next up, we have to argue that the random matrices satisfy the set-restricted eigenvalue condition. All right, so far we've said that if the set-restricted eigenvalue condition holds, then we can get you know, the favorable recovery properties. But you'll notice that up until now, we haven't actually said, say, how many measurements do we need in order to get 
uh, in, in order to get the recovery guaranteed. And the reason that didn't happen in the previous lemma is because the number of measurements affects whether or not we have the set restricted eigenvalue condition. Similar in sparsity-based compressed sensing to the number of measurements affects whether or not you have the restricted isometry property, but all that matters for recovery is actually having the restricted isometry property with appropriate constants. All right, so our goal is to show that the matrix A with n0, 1 over m entries indeed satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition uh, for a G given by a ReLU-based neural network. So in, in order to do this, we're going to need um, two technical lemmas, or really they're theorems. Uh, and these theorems are, are going to have a very different flavor from each other. Right? So the, the first theorem that we're going to need is a, a standard result about the singular values of a random matrix. So this is from uh, Roman Vershinen's notes uh, in introduction to the non-asymptotic analysis of random matrices, and it goes as follows. Suppose I have an M by K matrix with IID standard normal entries. So then I can make the following claim about the singular values and, uh, of, of that matrix A. So for all T bigger than zero, then with probability at least one minus two e to the negative t squared over two, then we have a lower bound for sigma min of A and we have an upper bound for sigma max of A. That lower bound is root M minus root K minus T and the upper bound on sigma max is root M plus root K plus T. So here this sandwiches in all of the uh, singular values uh, of A. Now, you should think of this as saying that like, tall Gaussian matrices are approximate isometries. Right, so here, if M is much bigger than K, then, uh, and then let's say T is uh, you know, like K or like a fraction of M, then uh, the left-hand side, root M minus root K minus T, is roughly the same as the right-hand side, root m plus root k plus t, right? because m was assumed to be much bigger than k. Right? And in that case, all the singular values are roughly the same, and so then this matrix A is going to basically stretch uh, all vectors the, the same amount, uh, and then with appropriate rescaling, then this is truly an isometry. Uh, okay, so this is the, the central workhorse that's going to say that the, uh, the matrix A on individual pieces of our neural network uh, is going to sort of behave well. It's going to have like, this is sort of like just saying the, uh, the set restricted eigenvalue condition holds on a given particular piece of the neural network where the, where the neural network is, is linear. So the, the second result that we're going to need uh, is, that, uh, is, a, is a partitioning theorem. Right? And this theorem is as follows. Suppose you have the space RK and it's partitioned by C hyperplanes. Now remember, a hyperplane is a co-dimension one linear surface, which is to say uh, it's defined by the the, the zero set of a single linear equation. So it has k minus one degrees of freedom. It splits RK into two halves. So here we have RK is partitioned by uh, C hyperplanes. And so we want to ask the question of how many total number of partition pieces are there? So we can draw a, a quick picture of this, right? In, um, in R2, right? We can uh, draw a whole bunch of uh, hyperplanes. And then here we can see all of the individual pieces. So for example, here's one piece, here's another piece, here's another piece, uh, etc. And our question is, how many possible such pieces are there? Now, if we were to do like a worst case bound and say, well, I have C hyperplanes, 
and each hyperplane splits uh, space into two pieces. So then the, the worst possible thing we could have is that every hyperplane sort of split everything that existed so far into two pieces. Uh, and so then you would get two to the C different p possible pieces. So this is actually quite a um, overestimate and one can do a lot better. Um, and what you can show is that the number of partition pieces is big O of C to the K. And so instead of being two to the C, it is C to the K. And the reason for the savings is when you plop down an additional hyperplane, it only intersects with some of the existing pieces, and each of those pieces now gets turned into two pieces. Right? And all of the pieces that it didn't intersect with uh, don't get further partitioned. Right? And in fact, this argument is how you prove this theorem. It's proven by induction uh, based on saying every new hyperplane you plop down it either intersects an existing piece or it doesn't, and then one of those you can write as, uh, uh, as, a, as a recurrence using uh, the, the number of uh, partition pieces of one fewer dimensional space. Yeah. All right, so we're not going to go into the, the details of the theorem, uh, but we are going to use this in order to prove a uh, recovery result for neural networks with, with RailU activations. Uh, so let's let, let's let's state the, the the lemma that we want to prove. So let's suppose that G, which is a map from R K to R N, is a D layer neural network, uh, where each layer is a linear transformation followed by a relu. So this is uh, this is not going to assume any particular form of the linear transformation. It's going to be potentially arbitrary, uh, and then. Uh, after applying that linear transformation, you're taking the maximum of each entry with zero uh, in a component-wise way. So now, suppose that G has at most n nodes per layer. Uh, here, this n can be, uh, n reasonably could be bounded by n because this generative network is meant to um, take a low dimensional latent code uh, in k dimensions and output a high dimensional image n so for many architectures, there might be fewer nodes in each of the inner layers than final pixels uh, in the image. Um, now, the, the lemma will state that if the number of measurements goes like k d log n over alpha squared, then a Gaussian matrix A with n0, 1 over m entries satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition on the range of G with parameter one minus alpha uh, with a particular probability that's at least one minus E to the negative alpha squared M. Right, so here note that uh, G of RK, that's meant to be the, the set of all possible uh, points G of Z for all Z and RK. Uh, and then here, alpha is just an arbitrary parameter, which is uh, bigger than zero. Right. So what this lemma is saying is that if you have roughly k measurements, then you this random matrix uh, enjoys this set restricted eigenvalue condition. And then from that, we know that we can get a favorable recovery performance. So this is very similar to a... Restricted, restricted isometry property condition in, in sparsity-based compressed sensing, um, which says if you have enough measurements, then A uh, enjoys the RIP with high probability. All right, so let's go looking into the, um, the, the, uh, a sketch of the proof of this claim. Right, so it's, it's a relatively beautiful and simple argument. Right, so let's let's think about you know before we go into the details let's think about what the this you know the, the structure of this neural network is right so we, we've assumed a network which is a series of linear layers followed by relu layers and so what we can say is from a mathematical sense this function is piecewise linear and so then at any given point on it we're on one of the piecewise linear pieces like locally, that uh, 
function is that it behaves in a linear manner. So except, of course, at points on the boundary between these, these pieces. Uh, but everywhere on the interiors, it behaves like uh, uh, just a, a linear function locally. Uh, so it's very natural to begin by asking, well, how many different linear pieces are there? Uh, because once we have uh, an understanding of all the linear pieces, then we're going to be able to say that objects in the range of G live in the union of particular subspaces, uh, and then we'll be able to appeal to the, uh, the, the theorem about the eigenvalues of random matrices on uh, four particular subspaces. Right? So, so we, be, we begin by saying, like, let's say I had a one layer net, how many different linear pieces is in the piecewise linear function described by it. Uh, and this we appeal to the theorem mentioned before. We have uh, roughly n to the k different linear pieces. Now, if I have d layers, then the worst case is that uh, each layer introduces n to the k pieces. Uh, and so then the next layer, each of those pieces could itself be broken into n to the k pieces of the next layer, and so on for d times. And so then here we can uh, sort of multiply this all up, and we get that after d layers of this network, we have at most n to the kd linear pieces. Okay? So here we can make now a, a claim that uh, the range of G lives in the union of at most n to the kd subspaces, where each of these subspaces has dimension k. Now, why does each of these subspaces have dimension k? Well, remember that G is a map from Rk into Rn. Right? So uh, specifying all of these pieces is, in essence, spe specifying an activation pattern for all of the neuron, for all of the relus, whether they're active or not. Uh, and with that pattern, then the whole network is locally a, a linear object. Right? So we have n to the kd subspaces, each of dimension at most k. Uh, so thus, the set of differences, x1 minus x2, where x1 and x2 are in the range of g, lives in the union of n to the 2kd subspaces, uh, each of dimension 2k. So remember that the set restricted eigenvalue condition was saying that uh, a uh, behaves well you know, not like a, a null space, uh, on uh, differences of pairs of points within the, the set we were interested in, and here that set is the range of G. Right? So, uh, so every point in this set lives in the union of n to the 2kd subspaces of dimension 2k. So now what we're going to argue is that any point in each of those subspaces uh, satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition and then we're going to add up over we're going to take a union bound over all such pieces right so on each particular 2k dimensional subspace a satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition you know, meaning that a acting on uh, the point x1 minus x2 uh, in l2 norm is bigger than uh, 1 minus alpha times the L2 norm of x1 minus x2. All right, so this holds a uh, uh, four parameter 1 minus alpha with probability at least 1 minus e to the negative alpha squared m, provided that m is uh, at least k over alpha squared. And so this is a direct consequence of the version and result about the, um, the singular values of tall random matrices. The, you might wonder, like, why is the random matrix tall in this setting? Because isn't A a wide matrix? Because A is M by N, and M is much less than N. And so that is indeed true. But if I, act, if I let A act on a 2K dimensional subspace, right? so remember that since A is Gaussian, it's rotationally invariant. So uh, its statistics are the same regardless of which 2K dimensional subspace that I choose. So I'll just choose the, the subspace given by the span of the first 2K standard basis elements. And so now that means I have a matrix A, which is the same as just a M by 2K matrix. 
And now I need m to be bigger than k to have any hope of you know, solving my problem. And hence I have a matrix A which is tall. And now that it's tall, I can use the version result to control the smallest singular values uh, of it. All right, so what we've shown is that on each subspace uh, of these differences of points within the range of G, then A satisfies the set restricted eigenvalue condition with parameter one minus alpha, provided by that M goes like K over alpha squared. Uh, so now the last thing we need is to make sure that the restricted eigenvalue condition holds on all of the subspaces at the same time. So we're gonna do a worst case analysis using a union bound. So remember that there are n to the 2kd possible subspaces, you know, each of dimension uh, 2k. So our failure probability is no worse than one minus n to the 2kd e to the negative alpha squared m. And we can argue that this is uh, on the order of one minus e to the negative alpha squared m, provided that m is sufficiently large, right? If m is sufficiently large, the latter small exponential will dominate the uh, former uh, term, the n to the 2kd term, right? And the exact way that these balance is m needs to be like kd log n over alpha squared. All right, so what, what this does, now that we've had this, we've actually proven the, uh, the result that we wanted. All right, so here, which we can go back to, to this theorem, right? What, what this theorem said was, if we had a, let's see, is this the right theorem? Yes, right, the, the theorem said that like, if we have a random measurements, like sufficiently many of them, m goes like uh, kd log n. Uh, and if g is given by a d layer ReLU net with at most n nodes per layer, uh, then our approximate minimizer, uh, which, solves, you know, which solves the optimization problem up to a factor or up to an additive uh, term of epsilon, uh, then this gives us like the correct object in the n up to the representation error, the noise level, and the error from optimization. So indeed, if our optimization error you know, becomes smaller, then the uh, recovery performance uh, becomes better, as, as it does if the noise is smaller and the representation error is smaller. And in the case where, 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 the, where, where the image x star is in the range of g and there is no noise, and there is no optimization error, then one would get exact recovery. All right, so what we've done is we've proven that for these ReLU nets, there is a, a, that if you can solve this optimization problem, then you get something close to the image that you are trying to find. So that leaves open so a, a remaining big question, which is how can you be sure that you're actually solving this optimization problem? Uh, if, if we remember, if we go back to uh, the recovery algorithm that we're trying to solve, we'll remember that this is a non-convex problem. And so in principle, if I'm going to solve this by a gradient descent method, then I could get stuck in local minima. So the existing theory so far uh, has nothing to say about that. Right? It says, suppose you don't get stuck in local minima, you can globally optimize it, but maybe you don't get all the way to the optimal value. Then you get close to the, the, the image that you're looking for. So in some sense, the, the theory that was provided was about uh, injectivity of the measurements um, on the range of the generative model. All right, so, so we're, we're left with our, our last question um, for this discussion, which is when can one solve the optimization problem that we wrote down before, which is written down here as well? 
Um, as we just mentioned, finding the minimizer for non-convex problems is NP-hard in general. Uh, however, you know, the literature is full of special cases where you can actually solve uh, problems that are NP-hard in certain cases. Uh, so let's take some inspiration from, from compressed sensing. Right? Let's remember in that case, uh, with a sparsity prior, you know, what we were wanting to do was to optimize, uh, to find the, the sparsest signal that was consistent with measurements, which is to say we may have wanted to optimize the L0 norm of some signal given that it's consistent with the measurements. Right? That also was NP-hard, uh, but we ended up uh, studying it in the case of uh, random measurements and in that case we were able to show that that NP-hard problem uh, could actually be solved by a tractable algorithm. Okay. So we're going to do something similar as well. We're going to assume a random model for G right? uh, and a random model for A as, as we have done already. Right. So the, our claim is that we can provably solve this optimization problem under an appropriate model for G, which is random. All right, so let's state what is this model. So let's, let's assume that we have uh, uh, a, a D-layer uh, ReLU network. Uh, so it's a map from RK to RN, and it's given by this form. So G of Z uh, takes Z and hits it with a matrix W1, and then takes a ReLU. And then it hits that with a matrix W2, and then uh, a ReLU, and then so on for D times up till uh, WD. Right, so this is just like the neural net considered before, uh, except there is no bias terms in this analysis. So and, and as that one, uh, the Ws uh, could be uh, and generally are fully connected in this analysis. So as, as a bit of notation, right, uh, the ith layer of this neural network has n sub i neurons. So then uh, wi is uh, in r to the ni by ni minus 1. So in order to make a, a claim about when we can solve this recovery problem, uh, like, like when we can actually succeed at the optimization, uh, then we're going to study an expansive Gaussian model uh, for G. So when I say expansive, what I mean is that the number of neurons grows in each layer. So here we can write this down uh, as ni is greater than some constant c times ni minus 1 log ni minus 1. So roughly speaking, we're going to assume that each layer uh, has a number of neurons that grows linearly up to this logarithmic factor. Uh, we're also going to assume that the coefficients or that the weights of this neural network are IID N01 entries. So this is an expansive Gaussian model. All of the entries are Gaussian. Oh. And then we're going to assume that we have enough measurements. And here that's going to look like saying M needs to go like KD log of uh, the product N1, N2, uh, N3 multiplied all the way up to ND. And so roughly speaking, this says we're going to assume that we have uh, on the order of k uh, measurements. And so it's probably worth uh, discussing you know, some of these assumptions. So the first assumption about expansivity of the net, this is fairly reasonable. Right? Let's remember that G is a generative model. Right? It, here it's trying to take a low dimensional latent code and then output a high dimensional image. Uh, and so it's going to do this through a series of layers. They're generally uh, going to have more neurons in each layer as this net, in some sense, adds redundancy to the system. Right? After all, the latent code is highly compressed and the images are highly redundant and G is going to, to have a sequence of transformations that go from the compressed version to the redundant version. All right, so it's natural for there to be expansivity of course, in, in real networks, one doesn't strictly need expansivity, and you might have the same number of neurons in successive layers, uh, and that is not going to fit in the framework of the, of the theory that we have. Um, but, but nonetheless, like, as a concept, expansivity uh, makes sense. 
Now you could ask, why do we need to assume that there's a logarithmic factor in here? And this is going to happen because of an artifact of the analysis. And it may even be possible that the analysis could be strengthened to not need that log factor. Really, you would expect this to be ni should be like 2 times ni minus 1. Uh, but we don't know how to prove that. All right, so then let's move on to the next assumption. So here we've assumed that the neural nets, uh, the G, has uh, weights that are given by standard normal random variables. All right, so at, at, at first pass, this might seem a little odd because this is what we do to initialize a neural network before training, right? You would take your G, you randomly choose a whole bunch of weights, uh, and then you would take your training data and you'd train G according to some process, for example, the VAE training process or the GAN training process, uh, and you would get some weights which are specifically not uh, random anymore. Uh, nonetheless, there's still a rationale for studying neural nets with random weights. So one is you could train your net like, like you do in the wild, uh, and then you could look at the statistics of the weights of that net after training. And to some extent, those statistics are, uh, roughly speaking, you know, bell curved. Uh, and so they have some Gaussian-like properties. Uh, another comment is that you know, the, the state of the art for theory, that you can even train neural nets to optimize uh, it, so like to converge to a global minimizer of their loss objective, that theory is relatively nascent. And the, the situations in which a result uh, exists for provably showing that the training converges to a global optimizer, uh, most of these situations occur in a regime where the weights of the neural network don't change all that much from where they were initialized. Now, in practice, we do know that weights change uh, a fair amount from where they are initialized, but the state of the art of theory hasn't uh, caught up to this uh, as of now. Right? And so then the, the final reason for, for studying the, Gauss, the case of Gaussian Ws is, I mean, in theory, one has to start somewhere. And uh, if one's going to critique this assumption on the Ws, then it would be most helpful to have a suggestion for what distribution one should assume the weights of the neural network are coming from. Now, of course, since we don't have clear mathematical quantifications of the natural signal classes that the generative models are being trained for, then uh, we don't really have a, a clear model for what the weights are for a network trained on those signal classes. Right? So, one could say we should study the Gaussian case simply because we don't have any particular other model which is uh, clearly better and um, potentially tractable. And so the final assumption is that m uh, goes like kd log n1, n2 up to nd multiplied together. But so largely speaking, this is what we want it to be, which is to say the number of measurements should scale like k. Uh, there are these additional factors, this d term and this log term. Um, it's possible that these uh, terms are not optimal, and we anticipate that they would not be optimal. Uh, but nonetheless, like relative to k, this uh, is the right sample complexity. All right, so now we can get to so the, the, the claim, which uh, I'll stay in very, very broad strokes for now. Uh, is that, um, so under these assumptions, then for any uh, image x star, which you're imaging, uh, where you're assuming that x star lives exactly in the range of g. So alternatively, you're saying, suppose that g actually is the true signal distribution, so then the image that you're looking for is in the range of g. Then you could run a gradient algorithm uh, with some particular nuances, and then that gradient algorithm will converge to z star uh, for measurements y equals a g of z star. Right? So roughly speaking, this says for an expansive Gaussian model that's sufficient, sufficiently expansive and has a number of measurements on the order of k, then uh, 
if you're imaging an object exactly in the range of the generative model G, then with high probability, the gradient descent algorithm will converge to it. And this result was introduced by Handen Borninsky and then also studied further uh, by uh, this paper Wen Huang et al. Um, and has been uh, extended to a, a, a variety of other cases by other authors. Right. So ultimately, what this work is saying is that it is indeed possible to solve the, the non-convex L2 minimization problem for compressed sensing under a GAN prior. Um, it is possible to do this, at least in, uh, to provide guarantees, at least in the random case. Now, the, the way this, this theorem works is it establishes a, a, a deterministic property which is about uh, the, the neural network uh, obeying like approximately Gaussian-like weights. And then under that deterministic property, then this uh, recovery condition holds for the convergence of a gradient descent algorithm. And then we also show that random, uh, random nets uh, satisfy this approximate uh, Gaussian property with high probability. And so it's a very similar line of reasoning um, to what's out there in the literature. Uh, and, and in this case, it, it shows that this like, conceivably very hard non-convex optimization can um, be optimized to convergence by gradient descent. So the, um, the, the last thing that I want to, to discuss is a bit of commentary about thoughts on GAN priors. I just have a, a, a few of these that, um, the, that I want to share. Right, so the, the first is that you know, from, from a geometric perspective, everything that we've done you know, makes sense. Right? So we have a, a k-dimensional signal model, which we've learned from data, and then we've asked, how many measurements do we need in order to pin down an image in this k-dimensional manifold? Well, very naturally, the answer is you need roughly k measurements. Right? So this is sort of exactly what we would hope it to be. Now, what's exciting is that this could actually outperform other types of priors, for example, a sparsity prior, because in principle, the, the K that you get for a particular natural signal class that you're interested in could be much less than the sparsity level uh, of those images with respect to, say, a wavelet basis. So we would expect that GAN priors could outperform sparsity priors significantly if k is much less than the sparsity of an, of an image. And it's reasonable to think that this uh, would actually be the case. Right? The, the reason for that is, like, suppose you have, uh, just take as, as a toy example, you know, your natural signal class are the images of a single train going down a single track. Right? This, largely speaking, is a one-dimensional parameter family. Right, so you should be able to describe every point, uh, every image of this train going down this track with one parameter. Uh, and so conceivably a neural network, a generative model could create uh, such a representation. Uh, but every image of this train from a wavelet basis, right, it can't you know, directly exploit the fact that you know what this train is doing. Um, and so there the true dimensionality, the true number of degrees of freedom is much less than the sparsity level. Right? So I, I want to conclude with, with one, you know, one big point about GAN priors, and that is that they are limited by their representation error. Right? And we saw this in the, the, the Bora theory, and in the latter theory we assumed the representation error was zero. Uh, so the, the GAN will only be good uh, only be as good as its representation error. After all, if you're assuming a point is in the range of the GAN, then you better hope that your image is very close to the range of the GAN for the GAN to be useful to you. Now, for, for, for real GANs that are trained now, they, they tend to have relatively large representation errors. And you could say, well, all right, well, I'm just going to try increasing K, the dimensionality of a latent space. Uh, presumably with larger k, I would have a more expressive uh, generative model, and so I should have 
uh, last representation error. Um, now, under, under the current theory, if you increase k, then what that says is that you'll need more measurements to pin down the, the exact point in the model that you're looking for. And uh, at first blush, that's very reasonable, uh, except that as I keep increasing k, then it's possible that uh, the number of measurements I need by my theory is actually larger than the number of degrees of freedom in my image, which then would sort of you know, negate the entire benefit of doing compressed sensing altogether. So, so we, we, we arrive at this situation where what we really suspect is that each added dimension for K, uh, right, it, it should make our models of our natural signal manifold slightly better. So increasing K should lower our representation error. Um, but the amount that each additional degree of freedom is added, uh, that should contribute to representation error less and less as I add more dimensions. Uh, nonetheless, the theory is saying that I need to pay a, a constant additional new cost uh, in measurement count for every additional K that I have. Right, so what, what I'm suspecting and what I hope this field does is that it, that it moves toward a theory that pays attention to the likelihood on the signal manifold. Right? After all, I could take n to be k, and in fact there are some nets where uh, k equals n, and we'll talk about those in two weeks when you talk about invertible nets, and those can actually recover images uh, competitively and sometimes better than GANs, even though their k is much bigger than the k of those GANs. So the, the difference in that performance just can't be explained by this going theory, which is to say it can't be explained by the idea that on a k-dimensional manifold you need k measurements because the whole point is that some objects on this manifold are more likely than others. We need to exploit that in order to recover uh, images and have a theory that says we can do that as efficiently as possible.